installed by April 2012. Progress on achieving the meet and meeting the April 12 deadline is also identified as May 2012 deadline is also identified on the attached plan. Question number three: Can you provide specifics on the $344,000 emergency fund? What was spent on intercom systems, computer equipment, video recording, and monitoring equipment? $135,000 for intercom repairs, $50,000 for software upgrades, $115,000 for cameras, $44,000 for four year maintenance program. Total, $344,000. Sites number four site specific challenges with meeting the April 12 target date for completion of the corrective action plan. There are, there are no challenges anticipated meeting the 2012 deadline. Progress in meeting the deadline is on target, as the corrective action plan indicates. We are monitoring our progress continuously and preparing a report that is submitted to the mayor and the CAO on a weekly basis. If issues are encountered, we will alert all necessary parties, including council. What budget, number five, what budget request if any will be made to have a debt? They have the matters that have been cited for corrective actions ameliorated. We will request future CIB funding, approximately $400,000 annually for future upgrades. In addition, we anticipate that approximately $36,000 in funds will be needed to, cost, to cover the cost of overtime that will be earned during this period of training. Number six, what locks are needed to come into compliance? What is the type and model number? Is required based on security system that we have. Are those the locks that you are currently using? Do you have, do you have in stock what is needed to provide a sufficient locking device to satisfy the citation? The locks are Southern Steel, model number number 10, model number 10, 300M, 1RHRB, 32D, slash 10, slash 300M1, LHRB, 32D, which were installed when the facility was constructed in 1996 and are still in use today. We maintain a sufficient supply of those locks and install them on a routine basis when they become inoperable. New transformers will be installed on doors as the new locks are replaced and we will maintain sufficient inventory of all locks going forward. There are no new costs associated with these locks. The costs are covered in the cities. CIP plan. We see no difficulty in meeting compliance requirements with the existing lock system. We address the issues associated with the false reads by repairing the door position switches. We also also we order replacement locks for the existing doors. Also, we can order replacement locks for the existing doors if we need to replace any devices. Number seven. How many cameras are currently in place? How many cameras are you going to install? Is there any upgrade involved in these cameras? What is the cost estimate? When will the installation be completed? What is the minimum requirement according to certification standards? Cameras are not certified, are not required by the Department of Juvenile Justice Standards. However, if the facility does have them, they must be in working order. There are 44 cameras currently in the facility. We are installing an additional 32 cameras. The additional camera cost is $115,000. Installation will be completed by April 2012. If the cameras are installed, they must be operational, and this is a minimal and maximum requirement. Question number eight. Based on certification standards of the items that have been cited, which of these would close the facility if not corrected? Life, health, and safety areas are the most important issues. Locking systems that don't work or youth counselors and youth counselor supervisors who are not trained in first aid, CPR, or emergency procedures, etc., are the highest priorities. If life, health, and safety concerns are not addressed, they could become the basis of decertification. If a, if a facility is decertified by the Board of Juvenile Justice, then the residents would have to be relocated. Residents can only be in certified facilities. Certified facilities include those on probation. The Board of Juvenile Justice will extend probation up to six months. Further, we believe the city would leave itself vulnerable to having, detention, to having the detention center closed 
if it chose to callously ignore the repairs cited and recommended in the report. We believe that it's important for the city to demonstrate a sense of urgency and a commitment to make the necessary capital investments to have these repairs completed expeditiously. Thus, we do not believe that there is any one repair that is more or less significant than any other. All have to be made and made within the, within the time frame given the city. Question number nine. Should you fail to meet, should you fail to meet correction action plan the detention center is decertified? What housing arrangements do you employ for the present population of the facility? Is there a need to devise a preliminary deployment plan for residents of this facility to be certified? The detention center does not have, this detention center does have an emergency plan that it would operationalize for any reason, if, if for any reason, it must close the facility. Let me repeat that. The detention center does have an emergency plan that it would operationalize if for any reason it must close the facility. That deployment plan can be implemented immediately in the event of a flood or man-made disaster. Chesterfield County Juvenile Detention Center and James River Juvenile Detention Centers are placed on alert if the situation develops and they require an evacuation. Sheriff C.T. Woody Jr. and his staff have agreed to provide the necessary transportation to the identified facilities. RJDC staff will be deployed to these facilities as needed or as required. The judges of the Juvenile and Domestic Relations District Court, the court's chief administrative officer, the court service unit director and deputy director, the Richmond Police Department's command structure, and the parents and residents would all be notified immediately as well. The media would also be notified by the office of the, of the press secretary. There will also be there will be a cost associated with relocating residents to either of these two facilities. Both of these facilities have a $150 a day per diem per resident. The population in the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center has been averaging between 30 and 40 youth per day. Number 10, if residents are relocated, what would be the cost of the city of placing the residents in an alternative facility, in an alternative detention facility? To house the residents in either Chesterfield County Juvenile Detention Center or James River Juvenile Detention Center, it costs between $135,000 for 30 residents and $180,000 for 40 residents per month. This is based on the following formula. $150 a day times 30 residents equals $4,500 times an average of 30 days. $135,000, $150, $40 residents, $6,000, 30 days, $180,000. Chesterfield County has said that they can take as many as 30 residents. James River can take as many as 10. In addition to the cost of the residents, there will also be transportation costs, which is estimated to be approximately $8,800 a month. This would cover the cost of two deputies at $400 a day, that's $200 a day per deputy, for 22 working days a month. This would be the transport youth to the detention facilities to court and back to the detention facility. Assuming that a strategy of out, of out placing the youth would be in place for six months, the cost would be approximately $52,800. These funds would be paid to the sheriff for transporting the youth back and forth from the city to the respective detention centers. Our employees would be deployed to these facilities would have to be reimbursed for their travel, and a determination would have to be made as to their eligibility for overtime to and from Chesterfield or James River. Question number 11. Is there a need to relocate any portion of the resident population during the period to complete the action plan? If so, what are the potential costs? No, there is no need to relocate any of these youth to these facilities where repairs are being made. We have considered this scenario to expedite the training. However, uh, there have been, we have been able to design a schedule to achieve the training requirements within the time frame that we are working on. Number 12, what is the age of the facilities located in Hemrico and Chesterfield County? Hemrico Juvenile Detention Center opened in 1980. The most recent upgrade, the expansion of the nursing home, was completed in the past three months. Chesterfield County Juvenile Detention Center was built in 1973. It was renovated in 2004. James River Juvenile Detention Center was built in 2001. 
have been right from Chesterfield County has been on probation. If so, when were they on probation? Neither of these facilities have been on probation since their construction. Are there any other detention facilities in the state that have been placed on probation since 2009? No facilities in this state have been placed on probation since 2009. Given that this is the only board request facility in the state on probation, and this is the second time in the state, and the second time in the last three years, that the detention center has been placed on probation, what I'm going on alleviated challenges contributed to the second occurrence. On the previous Department of Juvenile Justice audit, in August of 2010, the facility was in compliance with all the two standards, the intercom system and some maintenance issues which were corrected immediately. However, persistent equipment issues that were not properly persistent equipment issues that were not properly corrected by an unqualified vendor presented the unalleviated challenges that placed the facility in its current position. Number 16. What have those jurisdictions done to ameliorate the situation? That question does not apply uh, in, in these cases. Number 17. In addition to latest deficiencies with the electronic locking system, Security cameras. What other equipment deficiencies? That, what were there other equipment deficiencies at the detention center? The intercom system in the youth rooms was disconnected and had been disconnected for a number of years. While the intercom system is not a state mandate, the standards require that all systems are installed be operational. We could have removed the intercom system. However, we believe it should be left in place and functional with triggers that prohibit youth from misusing them. Therefore, they are being repaired and will be fully functional within the established time frame. Number 18. Has the new rapid system for employee timekeeping been fully installed? Are employees using the system to confirm their time in and to ensure their, that documentation will be available to verify staffing ratios for certification and to document that staffing ratio is met? Is there a paper backup for the Rapids computerized system to ensure that you will meet the requirements of the staffing ratio for documentation? The Rapids system for employee, employee timekeeping is not fully installed yet. SIS is running in a parallel is, is running in a parallel with TEMS. This means SIS is comparing the time and payroll from TEMS with what is being with, with what is processed in Rapids to ensure accuracy. Currently, employees are not being paid. Currently, employees are being paid based on the time in TEMS. It is anticipated that the system will be fully functional beginning February 11, 2012. At that time, all management functionality reports and absences and absent management reports and absent management as well as time and attendance will be in use for Rapids employees. For Rapids, employees do confirm their time in and out by either scanning their finger across the combo time clocks or entering time into a time card through their computer. Time is then reviewed and approved by the supervisor and reviewed by the timekeepers prior to submitting to payroll. Employees are paid based on time entered in TEMS until the, until the full, until um, uh, Rapids goes alive targeted on February 11, 2012. There's currently paper backup. There is currently paper backup because of the dual system. Once Rapids is fully installed, there will be no paper time cards and this copy time clock is down, at which point the contingency plan is to be used, which is a paper-based collection and approval of time to be manually entered in Rapids by the timekeeper. The detention center documents that it is in compliance with staffing ratios in a number of ways, including youth council supervisor and unit logs, as well as the common system. The next document. Any, any questions? Okay, okay. Is there any questions on the questions? Yeah. Yes, one of the questions, as I recall, had to do with the, uh, uh, the any other equipment issues that. Uh, that need to be examined. Uh, uh, and I seem to recall there were complaints about the radios, uh, that the uh, old, worn out, the battery packs were worn out um, and needed to be replaced. Why was that not included? 
Um, the radios were not included, I don't believe, in the auditor's report, and they were not included in the DJ's A report. That came up, I believe, when we were touring the so we Yeah. Now, and I'm just up saying this. committee as well, and I thought we said that we were going to attend to uh, try and replace them, or at least replace the battery packs. We have replaced the battery packs. We have five of those radios uh, brought back just the other, just last week. Five, five radios were brought back from the uh, shop. So, as far as I know, the radios are now working. Out of total how many? Uh, I wouldn't have any, I'd have to check. You've got how many people on staff who can use them in that? I mean, uh, on any given ship? If, if I could just interject here, uh, what we have done, we've looked at all our radios that need those batteries replaced. I know uh, on Friday, uh, one of the assistant superintendents went and picked up a number of batteries. And I personally took them over to the detention center to replace those. So we are keeping check on those batteries in those uh, radios. So to my understanding, there are no other radios that need battery replacement. Yeah. I'm sorry, can you identify yourself as the director? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sandra Martin, deputy director for the department. Now, I'm, I'm getting batteries, and then I'm getting battery packs. You can talk to them. And so, I don't know whether those are some kind of intact units that uh, have batteries uh, uh, built into them.
February and through March. We have built in time to uh, 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 provide for contingencies. Uh, we have one staff person, for example, this morning who was supposed to uh, be in the training but called in because of the buildings. So we'll make that up, we'll make that day up, uh, as well as uh, uh, any other contingency that we might have. But we are on a robust training schedule, to say the least. It's uh, uh, going on literally every week. Ms. Martin and I are out there every day, uh, and oftentimes uh, I'm taking some of the training as well as others individuals in the training. Are there any questions on that? No. Yes. Mr. Sanders, do you have a question? On December 15th, you responded to the auditor's audit of the detention home and said, with this writing, this is December 5th, we are pleased to report we have addressed these issues that require corrections. Which, which, uh... that, that, that was your letter to Mesh Mall on December 5th of last year. It's a sign of Charles J. Keeve. I didn't get a good part You said that as of December 5th, we are pleased to report we have addressed the issues brought up by the NAACP and your investigative actions. And though we have addressed those issues that require corrections. I think we would have to. Who am I writing to? Who am I to call? To the auditor's office. We have been addressing these issues. You say in the past we've addressed them. And have made the the issues that require past tense corrections. We we have addressed them. We've addressed them in a corrected action plan. Is that dated prior to December fifth? I mean, corrected action plan is helping the job. We provided a uh, corrected action plan to the Department of Human Justice. As of December fifth, you had not addressed the issues. Is that correct? We addressed them through a corrected action plan. Some of these things take time to do. We can't bring all the people on for training. We can't. Trained 40, uh, 42 uh, youth counselors in, in 40 hours of training and still keep the place, the place running. We were asked to develop a corrective action plan, which is what we did. I'm going to ask it again. Madam President, yeah, if I can follow along with uh, Mr. Sanders' question, uh, I read the paper. Dr. Graham, who plays me here, whose comments were even more uh, resolute that, uh, that uh, uh, this is a wonderfully run operation and that uh, uh, virtually poo pooing the findings of the, of, of, of the auditor. Um, and it seems to me that that was the very first falling off track. Because if we don't acknowledge fault, you can't fix fault. If we're going to claim repairs have been made uh, before they're made, then, then uh, this puts everything else in question, including the prescribed plan that's not completed with regards to the fence. So, uh, uh, thought we had lost Mr. Dow last week in Health and Human Services and Education Committee who went off because of things that are just not true. We've got to do some truth telling. We can't make decisions on untruths and expect them to work on behalf of the people we represent. We can't we can't count this delays when the auditor is trying to give us reports and all we get is foot dragging from administration or misdirection that somehow all is well or it's not as bad as it's being reported here. We can't fix them if we don't acknowledge that they work. And so, uh, I talk about lessons learned. This is lessons learned for all of us. Uh, for this council to provide more scrutiny and urge you when I met with you doing the tour and you fed me that marvelous lunch, that was acknowledgement that these were long-standing problems. It didn't just happen. And, and the fact of the matter is you've not requested from this council
to budget it to fix them. Now, I don't know whether you've been told not to do it, I said that to you then, or whether you've chosen not to do it, but if you don't make the budget request, then we can't get them fixed. You can't get them fixed. And so I don't know where all this leads to, but uh, 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 Mr. Marshall is a big dog. So we'll just sort of beat up on him. Madam President. President, yes, sir. I'd like to address Mr. Zero's comments uh, and, the, and the concerns of perhaps some others. I think what's most unfortunate in this entire situation is that the many excellent things that the juvenile detention center in Richmond is doing are being overlooked. I had an attorney tell me Friday afternoon who frequents the juvenile detention center on a regular basis and goes back into the juvenile detention center on a regular basis that it has the finest school program that she's ever seen and it is probably the flagship of the Richmond Public Schools. And Mr. Marshall Marks, who is the principal of that school, is an extremely dedicated, conscientious, professional, and accountable administrator. And the children who were there, even for short periods of time, showed remarkable gains on test scores that are computer generated. We have a school program that goes 11 months of the year, more than what is required. They provide, the teachers provide an extra month of training of education beyond the regular school year. We have been told by many individuals that the food that the, the children, the residents receive at the juvenile detention center is some of the best food they've ever seen given to any incarcerated person, adult or juvenile. Nobody, rarely, do you ever hear a young person complain about the food. There is always an ample portion and it is always well presented uh, and in a pleasing kind of a way. We have health care that's provided seven days a week by two qualified nurses, an RN and an LPN. In addition to that, thanks to you and the mayor, we have a contract with the um, MCV Hospital with VCU Health Systems, is the official name. We have doctors who are out there twice a week to see young people on Mondays and Thursdays. Every child has an opportunity to see an MD. I don't think that happens anywhere in the city except the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center. There are very few, if any, and maybe you need to ask the state, if there are any other juvenile detention centers that provide seven day a week medical care at the level and the quality that we provide. The place has been, when I was out there as superintendent, the staff used to kid me because every time somebody would come through the door, I'd give them a tour. They'd tell me I needed a tour guide hat. But I was very proud of that facility. I'm proud of it today. It's always clean. The staff care about kids. They're very, very dedicated individuals. So I just want to set the record straight. That yes, we have problems. We have acknowledged where those deficiencies exist. We see this as an opportunity to make bigger and better strides and to get our facility back on track as far as these eight standards or whatever the word that we missed. We feel confident that we can do that. But I don't think for one minute in all good conscience that you or I as public servants for this city should be so remiss as to focus only on the negative and not acknowledge the many, many good things that are happening. In addition, I will just say that since 2009, we have not had, I think I can't remember the specific month, but we have not sent any juveniles to the jail in the city of Richmond. Sheriff Woody has been able to close the juvenile tier and use his juvenile, use his deputies for other supervision because we have held on to the young people until they turn 18. And then if they're sentenced to the Department of Corrections, 
we turned them over to the jail on their 18th birthday or the day after. But in a lot of cities, in a lot of counties around the Commonwealth of Virginia, when a juvenile is tried as an adult, he's sent over immediately to the adult jail. So there are, and, and I also add to you that if you go back in your memory before I came on board, you will know that there were many years when the juvenile detention center, even the new facility, was badly crowded. But because of the work that the juvenile court has done, the court service unit has done, and the Department of Juvenile Justice, or the Department of Justice Services has done, we have had a significant impact on reducing the admissions to juvenile detention. Now, not everybody may agree with that, but I will tell you it's the right thing to do. Madam President.